for the final event of this conference on New Deals in Europe and America, I thought it would be appropriate uh, to do something really quite special, uh, and that is uh, to have a, a, a keynote that uh, would help bring to life for us all in a very personal and direct way uh, an aspect of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, of America's New Deal, that uh, is uh, often left uh, outside of our uh, discussions when we're focusing on the, on the tasks that, uh, and challenges that we face. Uh, and it's an important aspect of the New Deal. I think in some ways a fundamental aspect of it uh, and something of which is uh, important to me personally because uh, my father, as parents of many people here, but my father was a child of the New Deal. I guess I'm a grandchild of the New Deal. Uh, he understood from the beginning because his own background was agricultural and agricultural economics. And his first job in the summer of 1934 was with the Agricultural Adjustment Administration in Washington, D.C. Uh, that the New Deal was about the land, it was about the people, it was about the, 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 uh, uh, the human and social crisis, which was also a cultural uh, crisis in the United States at the time. Uh, and as the New Deal uh, developed, it addressed these questions in important ways, artistically uh, and uh, architecturally, uh, and in uh, raising the profile and the role, especially of women in our society in ways which had not been done before. Uh, and so I'm very, really pleased, I'm actually quite thrilled uh, if I might say, to have as our keynote speaker uh, uh, an individual, Catherine Flynn, uh, who has um, devoted, well, let's just say quite a few years uh, to uh, an, an enormous amount of effort to the um, project of bringing the New Deal uh, to the living generation, uh, of bringing the culture and the art and the uh, social transformation affected by the New Deal uh, to Americans today and to the world today. Uh, th she, is the, she was born in, in West Texas and understood the, um, the agricultural and land issues as in many ways just as my father did. Uh, a little further north, actually, he was born in southern Ontario, so it was, but it was, it was close enough uh, to be deeply engaged in these questions, and certainly by the 1930s he was. Um, and uh, in, uh, she's lived most of her life in New Mexico, where she discovered, as people who live in Austin and look around can discover, uh, that a great deal of the south and the southwest of this country was constructed. Uh, and uh, by the New Deal, it was in line with an aesthetic uh, that emerged at that time. And much of that is unnoticed and much of that is unknown. Um, and uh, she uh, acted on her interest in this by founding in the 1990s the National New Deal Preservation Association, which has as a spin-off the Living New Deal Association as a, uh, a sister organization. And so she's been at the heart of the effort to keep the New Deal very much uh, uh, in its proper place, uh, or in a place which, from which it had been slipping in our national consciousness to bring it uh, and give it the importance that it deserves, especially on these dimensions that are uh, really part of the, what makes this country into, what has made this country into what it is from a cultural and artistic aesthetic standpoint. Um, so, um, and I'm, I'm pleased to say she's assisted by Alana McGratton, who's the president of the New Mexico uh, chapter of the NNDPA, if, I, uh, uh, if I'm uh, uh, correct about that. And I'm therefore uh, most delighted to welcome uh, my new friend, uh, Catherine Flynn, uh, who comes to us from the state of New Mexico and to speak to us about the uh, spirit 
of the New Deal. I want to thank you for including the women in the New Deal as part of this conference and allowing me to share about this valuable component uh, because um, I hope I'll be able to enlighten you on all of the kinds of things that the women found and got involved in and came successful with. I have put, we've had put on the table, each of the tables, materials for you to take uh, home, and I would uh, just uh, suggest that I believe there's one sheet that has an order form if you're interested in any of the books that we have. Our newest book is on the, one is on the table, and it is about the women in the spirit of the New Deal, and um, that is basically uh, the basis of my talk for today. Um, there are there is a list of all the different programs, starting with the one his father, grandfather was in. Um, and uh, I hope you will uh, take those so that you can learn about every one of them in your spare time. But <laughs> um, as we all know, women uh, in the 1920s, the suffragettes uh, reached out and cracked a little bit of the glass ceiling in terms of the lives of women in the world. And in 1933 to 43 with the New Deal, women increased that crack significantly with the various jobs that they were allowed to go into and had great success with. And so I want to talk about who some of them were. I, and certainly, I think you would agree with me that probably the first woman I should talk about was Franklin's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. She was indeed a very influential power in everything having to do with the New Deal and in this country. She inspired loyalty of her friends and her co colleagues, and she pulled a lot of women in that she saw that were doing things that needed to be done and uh, got them involved in these programs. The second woman, of course, uh, in most circles of New Deal is, was a woman named Frances Perkins. Frances Perkins had been a person who worked with Roosevelt when he was the governor of New York, and they got along well, and she was a strong woman, and so when he became governor, I mean, the president of the United States, he contacted her uh, to, to help him uh, as the Secretary of Labor, the first woman to ever be a cabinet secretary. And of all of the ones that one would think he would have put a woman into, he put her in labor. And he did this because, as he said, I believe in you because I know you believe in this, and you'll put your back into it more than anyone I know, and you'll drive it through. Well, she did. We have Social Security and all of the forms of regulatory uh, things that come out of our labor departments, our labor legislation, and she did a fantastic job. Um, <clears throat> She also uh, got to be known as the architect uh, and possibly the um, <clears throat> mother of the Civilian Conservation Corps. And <clears throat> as such, she and FDR partnered again in order to solve two problems. One, the environmental problem of the land blowing away or being in really con terrible condition and the fact that the young people, particularly the young boys, had no jobs and the families were starving. And so they sent them out into the world and said, go find a job. Well, he said, okay, most people don't realize this, but I'm a tree farmer. And by God, let's get those boys to plant trees all over this nation and save our land. And then he put them into the national parks 
working on all of the different parks, building roads into them and buildings and any number of things. <clears throat> so they were very successful at that also. <clears throat> I would just note that those CCC boys in the program, which was run by the Army, they learned many things. They got new skills. They got educations, which they didn't have. And <clears throat> in the end, of course, they were sent off to World War II. And I have known a number of those fellows. And I'm very proud to say that they have given me a CCC bolo tie because I helped them put on a national conference in New Mexico. Most of them are all dead. The ones that are still alive, which is not very many, I kidded them about, you lied about your age to get in. And they said, no, I didn't. My mom did, or, or my dad did, because they got paid a dollar a day. And that was a lot of money. They got to keep a do $5 every month because they already were getting clothes and shoes and a bed they didn't have to sleep in with their brothers and sisters. And they, were in, they thought they were in a great deal. The families thought it was a great deal too because they were able to feed the other children and they were able to get back with that $25 a month into buying food and clothing and things that were needed for the family and therefore helped the economy of the towns they lived in. I would just uh, note that you should be aware and put it on your calendar that PBS is going to be featuring a documentary on Francis Perkins on March the 1st. So check that down. It's called Summoned Francis Perkins and the general welfare. It has been shown in uh, three places in the last month, and it's getting great reviews, so I'm sure. And it's being sponsored primarily by the Francis Perkins Center, which is her home, and her grandson has developed a whole other nonprofit uh, that we work closely with. Now, most people think that, of course, this CCC was all for boys, but there we have found one woman that was involved, and uh, she is Mildred, or she was Mildred Valandry Blanche, and she worked in Nebraska with Native Americans, and she was the only white woman, so they called her White Flower, and she helped them with all their equipment. Then there were, of course, secretaries and cooks and whatnot, but she was the only CCC in Rowley that we have found. Now we move uh, to the secretaries that served uh, Roosevelt. Uh, the one that was with him the longest was Marguerite Missy Lehand, and she was his gatekeeper. If you wanted to get through to Roosevelt, you had to make sure that you uh, got her, her uh, agreement because she was a tough one. She started with him in 1920 and ended in 41 when she had a stroke. He was very beholden to her and all of the things that she did for him as her secret his secretary for so long. And as an end result, he gave her half of his, he left her half of his estate at the time of his death. She was followed by Grace Tully, a woman that here Eleanor found in the D Democratic National Committee in 1928 and said, you better come to Washington, we could use you. And so she put her in with Missy Lehand, and when Missy had her stroke, then Grace took over. The third woman in this slide that shows uh, is, uh, well, there's four, but the I will talk next about <coughs> uh, Daisy Sukley, Margaret Daisy Sukley. She was his sixth cousin and a neighbor and they had grown up together. She was his confidant, and she kept him company when uh, Eleanor was out in the world with providing all the things that he had sent her off to do. And um, she was with him on many, many occasions and uh, various 
they had lots of communication back and forth, letter writing and whatnot, and he would share with her things that he thought of, some of the things he thought about Churchill and Stalin and the various ones. And um, she kept all of that uh, correspondence and it was put in a, the FDR library, which she later worked in herself to make sure everything was done properly. Uh, <clears throat> the CCC, as I mentioned, was one of the very first programs, if you'll note in the list, but, and they didn't have a whole lot of artists. They had some uh, that were in, involved in helping make posters about the different parks. But uh, we found that a majority of the artwork that we see from the CCC were from other uh, programs. And some of these programs you can see in the slide of showing you about four different uh, posters in each slide. And this publicized the different programs that were a part of the New Deal programs. Uh, it was there were a number of programs. I'm going to start with 1934, the Treasury Section of Art. And that was <clears throat> one that was busy putting a lot of murals in post offices. And you know, there's a ton of people who go in post offices and never see a mural that's right over the postmaster's door. And the same can be said for other public buildings all over the country. We go into these public buildings not to see art, unless we're really looking for it, and lots of people miss it. I hope you will go home and go look in your post offices and your courthouses and whatnot and see what art you've got in your home area, your home state. They wanted to make sure that this was good art, so they set up five main goals, to secure the best quality art to embellish our public buildings, to stimulate the development of American art, to employ local talents wherever possible, which were required to depict what the countryside looked like and what the co community was like, and to secure cooperation of the art world in selecting the artists to do the work, and to encourage project proposals of competition to make sure that they had really good ones. Um, and the post office at one point in 1948 had a competition to determine what was the best post office mural in every state. So go find out what was the best one for your state. You might be able to find that in the um, Living New Deal uh, website which has only 15,000 towns on it at this point in time. So you click on a little dot, it opens up th what's in that town in terms of buildings or art. And these are being done by geography students at the Department of Geography at, in Berkeley, California, and was started with one of our board members who was a geography professor there. We assume that they will probably get another 15,000 before they're finished uh, because there was so much done. Recently, the post office also featured some of those murals with postage stamps. And they're no longer, I believe, in your local post offices, but if you want to find some, you can contact the National Office of the USPS and can purchase some of those postage stamps. They had about eight that they uh, showed off. And one of them was done by uh, Isla McAfee, a Taos woman artist, and she had done this one that's in the image here is at Clinton, uh, Texas, but she did one in Cardale and Edmond and Florence, Colorado. And Florence, Florence, Colorado was the one that was on the postage stamp along with the others. Then we moved to the Public Works of Art Project and we have a map of the region of all the public art uh, projects that went on and the one of the state directors was from New York, and she also had Connecticut and New Jersey, and another woman had the program in Portland, Oregon. Then we have, uh, and that woman, woman from New York is Juliana Riser Force, and uh, you can see her in the picture with all the other PWAP directors, state directors. She's the only female there. Um, then the 
the beautiful floral presentation there was done by Catherine Travis, another PWAP artist. And then Amy Franz Gorham uh, has done a, a whole series of art at the, in the CCC camps. Uh, and so you can see some of the army looking barracks and, or tents and other things that she did. Uh, and was also involved in the putting in murals all over Coit Tower in San Francisco. Then we moved to the National Park Service. Now, they didn't have women rangers. That was, you know, not uh, the order of the day until 1937. And we have a picture here of Elizabeth Yelm Kingman, who was one of the very first women rangers hired by the Park Service, and she had a degree and a double major in anthropology and French, and she was sent to Mesa Verde National Park in New Mexico and served as a ranger and as a museum assistant. And I suspect in that capacity, or somewhere along the line, she got to know really well the man that was doing a big mural there. And they ended up marrying and he also did three post office murals all over the country. They had two daughters, and one of them just happens to be my secretary in Santa Fe. And she's mighty proud of being a New, Build, New Deal baby. The next project was the Treasury Relief Art Project, uh, commonly referred to as the Trap. Uh, and then we move into the biggie, the Works Projects Administration, the WPA. <laughs> When you talk about New Deal, people on the street may have had somebody that was in the WPA or maybe some family member that was in CCC. Those two were the biggies in terms of hiring so many people uh, and therefore so many families affected. Uh, most people think of the WPA first and foremost as all those boys that were leaning on those shovels. Well, they didn't lean very hard because they sure built a hell of a lot of things in this country. And then we have the other WPA programs which people know less about. Let's go for the Federal Music Project, which was uh, led by a man, a Russian fellow named Nikolai Sokolov, and he wanted to have a symphony, because he was a symphony conductor, he wanted to have a symphony in every state in the Union. Uh, he pulled it off, pretty much, except in New Mexico because we have culture. We already had a, a symphony in the 30s in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So the woman who was the federal director of the music project came up with a whole new idea that nobody else did initially, and then some others thought, maybe that's not a bad idea. And what she did was decide, instead of a symphony, to hire native um, Hispanic individuals or Spanish people who had all this Spanish folk music, but they had no music, written music. They had it all up here in their brains and in their ears. They learned it passing up to New, uh, New Mexico from Spain and Mexico. And so she hired those musicians, half of them, to play the music and the other half to write what the others were playing. And as an end result, they came up with printed music of Spanish folk music, dance tunes, children's games, and they then created a little booklet and they mimeographed it, and some of us remember about the mimeographs. They, by the time we found one, it was very very faint and it was hard, but we pulled it off and we printed, we reprinted the book on the Spanish music of, that came through that program in New Mexico. But yes, there were symphonic conductors. One was Florence Beatrice Price, who's in a 17 slide. Uh, you see a variety of the women there. And she was a composer first African-American to achieve national recognition. Uh, she wrote symphonies and uh, was given many awards. She <clears throat> uh, 
she was invited by here again, Eleanor brought her to the White House and got her involved in all the things that in the music world. Uh, I just shared with you about Helen Chandler Ryan, the woman that did the music books, and uh, she's the one with on the phone. And then we have Mabel Rice, who was a composer of choral music, and particularly in the Bay Area. I'm sorry, uh, Antonio Brico was in the Bay Area, and uh, Mabel Rice was in Boston. And so we have all these different programs in terms of music that happened all over the country. Then we moved to the Federal Writers Project. Uh, you know, writers were starving to death, the same as everybody else, the artist, whatever. So they said, okay, we're going to have writers write about the state they live in. And they even hired people who were not writers. They just said, go out and write about where your town, what's in your town, what's in your county. Give us something that tells us about America, your America, in your town and area and state. And consequently, there are 48 state guidebooks that are in many, many libraries all over this country. And there are also great big guidebooks on Washington, D.C., New York City, some of the San Francisco. So if you want to go and look and see what your state uh, was looked like back in the 30s, go ask a librarian about it. They'll probably be able to pull one up for you. Then <clears throat> we have, actually in New Mexico, the people who ran the Federal Writers Project were the wives of the Federal Art Project uh, artists. So they were kind of double dipping there, I guess. Uh, then we go to the Federal Theater Project. Federal Theater Project was run by a woman named Hallie Flanagan. In 1937, she wrote about this project that despite the hard times, 12,000 people were working in 158 theaters and in 28 states playing to 500,000 people in various audiences on different theater projects programs. She said it was wonderful, but there was this inflexibility about being in a government program. Uh, some of us may understand that. Um, and she was kind of dealing with the uh, snobbish and contemptuous uh, attitudes of people about those theater folks. You know, they're all pretty strange. But uh, she got it done, and uh, it did a great deal for those artist in the theater world. Uh, one of them was a woman named Grace Howard Hayward Gatz on slide 20, and she was a poet, she was an actress and a playwright, and uh, many, some of her plays were written or played a thousand times. Uh, so she was a very popular playwright and an actress, a very active suffragette that raised money to benefit pioneering women that were trying to, were struggling. Um, then we moved to the Federal Art Project, which was here the biggest one in terms of the art programs. Um, and there were women in various capacities, the field supervisor, the exhibition manager, the national information officer, the national coordinator of the Index of American Design, and then there were three in the state re offices, the New York, Illinois, and Ohio. Uh, and the statistics that uh, we have in New Mexico about the artists in that program was that we had 176 uh, artists, and 41 of them were females. We also had 28 that were um, Native American, and of that group, there were five females. There were 113 Hispanics, and of that group, 36 were females. And we had one lone African American sculptor in New Mexico whom I got to know uh, he became a professor of 
literature in North Carolina, but came back to see a sculpture of a mother and child that he did for our children's hospital. And uh, the children would like to pull up and, and stand by the little boy that mother was nurturing. And they would pull up by the mother's thumb frequently when they were in the clinic. And one day he walked in and told me who he was, and I was the administrator, and I said, would you make us another thumb for mother just like the one you made originally? And he did. So uh, he was pleased that we still had his work in the hospital. Um, moving to uh, Dorothy Dunn in slide 21, this woman was, uh, became very well known throughout New Mexico because she was an artist and an art teacher at the Santa Fe Indian School. It was a boarding school which still exists in Santa Fe. Um, she impacted the lives of many, many teenage and young adult Native American artists who would become more famous. They were first time probably away from home of their reservations and their pueblos. And she insisted that they draw or paint scenes of their local uh, home sites so that that helped them with their homesickness uh, and stuff being so far away from their families. Um, many of them became well known. One was Maria Martinez. She was from San Ildefonso Pueblo. Maria was um, a potter and became very famous nationwide and worldwide because of a mistake she made one time. She was firing her regular pots and probably left them in there too long and they burned to be black. And guess what? She became famous for black pottery and uh, went on to do uh, various things and getting various awards, including the most prestigious art award from France, as did Dorothy Dunn and Pablita Velarde. Uh, but before I get to Pablita, let's talk about Gisela Leffler uh, with the little children, the folk art music, uh, folk art uh, images. Uh, she was from Austria and studied in St. Louis and other places. But in St. Louis, she was known for just painting on things wherever there was a panel, so, and she'd start painting. And one of the things she painted were these beautiful little children in the surgical room where these kids were having surgery. So if they went to sleep looking up, they could see all these children dancing around on the ceiling. Then she came to New Mexico, and she did similarly four murals for us at Kerry Tingley Hospital for Crippled Children. And those are still with that facility, uh, which is in Albuquerque now. Then uh, we go to Pablita Velarde in 24. This woman uh, was a Native American from Santa Clara, who also was at the Indian School, and did get very well known for painting scenes of her family and her the scenes of her different pueblo. In fact, she did it so well that there were thir she did 34 paintings for Bandelier National Monument. And she got in big time trouble with the Indian elders because she painted things that were not supposed to be told to those white folks. Um, and uh, she didn't care. She dealt, dealt with them and uh, came out unscathed and was very pleased because she made $5 a day when those CCC boys who were working at Bandelier uh, only made a dollar a day. So she thought she was really living high on the hog. And she had two children to uh, take care of at the same time. And I think the son created a few problems while he was there. But um, she was very proud and became a very well-respected uh, Native American woman in the world. Her daughter, granddaughter, and great-granddaughter now have followed her uh, in the art world. Then we have in slide 25, Augusta Fells Savage. 
who was born in Florida and learned how to sculpt and studied in Paris in 29 to 31 and then came back and became the director of a center in Harlem. Um, and she was the first um, African American elected to the Association of Women Painters and Sculptors and in the was in 37 commission to do a piece for the World's Fair. She had an associate named Selma Hortense Burke, who was also a sculptor and also worked at the Harlem Community Art Center. And she sculpted portraits of famous African Americans. But you know, she did one of a white man. And if you dig in your purse or your pockets, you may have that portrait because it is of Franklin Roosevelt on the Roosevelt dime, which was used for that purpose. Slide, slide 26 was Florence Ashton Swift, another artist and worked in mosaic tiles. She studied in Venice and Ravenna, and in the 30s, she worked in the WPA FAP project in the Golden Gate International Exhibition in 39, and then she did one of two of the mosaic tiles that is on the front of the building of a museum at UC Berkeley in San Francisco, in Berkeley, I'm sorry, and it's on the cover of the book that we have there on the table of all the women. There is a second mural, as you can see, uh, in the front of that building, and that one was done not by her, but by Helen Bruton. And Helen was one of three women, all sisters. She had twin sisters. And they did mosaic tiles uh, in various places in, in uh, California, including the Mother's Building in the San Francisco Zoo, which was also the zoo itself was a New Deal project. Then we have Vera Bach who was raised in Russia, born and raised there, and came to the United States, to New York City, and got caught up in the New Deal art program because Mayor LaGuardia learned about her and hired her as part of the, one of the federal projects to create posters about all the different departments of government in the town, the little town of San New York City. So she became famous because of those things that she did in that particular project. The slide 28 you will see is of Zama Vanessa Helder, was a watercolorist, an artist, and a teacher. Here she is. And she has done both scenes of CCC camps and also Grand Coulee Dam. Uh, so that was where she was assigned to work. We have on slide 29, uh, <clears throat> an older woman, Josephine Height Joy. She started out in the WPA FAP program in 1936 when she was 66 years old. And she was a self-taught artist and she first was assigned to do some uh, demonstrations of what the Camp Balboa looked like in California. Then she moved on to do an exhibition at the 1936 San Diego World's Fair. Then she moved into the, FA, the WPA music program and was a countrywide singer there in the area for seven months. After that, she was hired by the WPA to be a nursemaid. And finally, she got back into the WPA art project again in 39, but they had to let her go because she had reached the maximum WPA employment periods allowed by law. <laughs> so she really uh, took advantage of the WPA to the max. Um, she did some work at the San Diego Zoo and showing the animals and whatnot. In summary, I would just share that, in, just to give you a sense of things, 193 competitions of art by over 13,000 artists 
with 36,000 designs and over 1,000 towns and cities boast federal buildings with New Deal murals and sculptures inside and out. So don't miss them, all 1,000, go see them. Then in the New York area, Audrey McMahon, who was the head of New York and Connecticut and New Jersey's federal art project, noted these statistics. In 1935, 5, 000, to 40, 1943, 5,000 painters, sculptors, graphic and commercial artists, craftspersons, and art teachers were employed. By May 1939, 8,742 paintings and 108 murals, 41,787 prints, and 1,707 sculptures and architectural works were created just in that area. She went on to be involved with the graphics section of the Ward Services Division, uh, which I thought they did posters primarily to say join the Army, join the Navy, or buy war bonds. But I learned the other day that some of those mural painters were hired to execute camouflage patterns for tanks, ships, and other military objects. We have now a person I just share briefly about, and that's Dorothea Lang. We do not have a slide about her, but on the table you have in the, the brochure about the book is some of her photography. She was, there were five women in the Farm Security Administration program, but she was obviously the most famous. Many people are familiar with her paint, her photograph, The Migrant Mother. And uh, I would just share that her granddaughter lives in Santa Fe and tells me, you know, Grandma would be so amazed. She would be turning over in her grave if she realized that I was the kid, the granddaughter that carried on her legacy since I gave her so much grief as a kid. Then uh, we have the first judge, the first federal judge that came about also during the New Deal, and her name was Jessie Margolin, which was a very big, big position for a woman that evolved out of the New Deal. Uh, the last two women I want to share about were a couple of uh, just common folk that made it big in their own way. Mary McLeod Bethune um, is, it was the 15th child of 17 children of former slaves. And she was, thanks to Eleanor again, brought to become the special advisor to FDR on minority issues. She was an educator. She started her own private school in Dayton, Florida, and that later became a college. She was a suffragette. She organized voter registration in the face of the KKK in her state, and she helped found the National Council of Negro Women, bringing uh, 29 organizations together um, in working together for women. Uh, she encouraged, she was encouraged, like I said, by Eleanor, and Eleanor made sure that she became one of the 35 members of the National Advisory Committee of the National Youth Administration, another program that dealt with the children that were still home, but they could give them new educational and get paid to do various things in their community. One lady told me in New Mexico that she got $5 a month, and by gosh, she played the piano for the choral director in the high school, and she was the only girl in her class that graduated that had a brand new dress instead of an old one to get graduated in. Uh, Bethune was very involved in all the Negro affairs of the NYA. Then we moved to another woman shaker and mover, Molly Dusen, Mary Molly Dusen. Eleanor once quoted that in 1933, there were about 35 women who came into important positions in Washington. But after that, in the next five, six, seven years, there was an enormous increase 
in the number of women who came to hold office um, in various jobs all over the country. Um, and she noted that this woman herself, Molly Dusen, had never held a job uh, except as the vice chairman of the Democratic National Committee in charge of the women's division. And as a result uh, of doing all that she did to give women jobs or provide placement for them in work all over, um, Franklin Roosevelt referred to her as the little general. And uh, he knew that she was a tough one to, and she would get things done. Back then, women had a tough time, and they had to persevere no matter what. One of those was back to Franklin Perkins, Francis Perkins, who gave us the Social Security, and at the same time, she was dealing with a husband who was manic, depressive, and an alcoholic, and raising a two-year-old or three-year-old little girl. And ironically, the day that the Social Security bill was signed, she got called by the institution saying, your husband's disappeared, and she had to go and find him and didn't get to be there for the signing of the Social Security, which is what sometimes happens with women and mothers and wives, and in this day and age, to fathers also, I'm sure. They made many sacrifices. They gave them experience in law, art, education, labor, many, many fields. And they cracked that glass ceiling just a little higher. And for that, we are very, very thankful. I have My closing statement, which I didn't get up here with, I would just say that in these two days, we have heard a lot about the importance of educating women and educating all of us, as it was done in the New Deal, but educating women. The other thing was to make sure that there was All programs were all inclusive, getting the very basic groups in our communities involved and involving women in that because women can do it and they can do it well. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the spirit of the New Deal. Kathy, thank you very, very much. It's just, just an amazing and a wonderful talk. I just uh, think that it gives us a, a, something really that we will carry with us for a very long, long time. It's totally, And the New Deal is with us. You can look out, if you can see, the Texas Tower is a New Deal uh, uh, artifact. And later today, I think the weather will permit us to go out and see the Mansfield Dam, which is, uh, the, the, uh, created Lake Travis and therefore gives us a, a place to have a libation for those who are uh, still with us at that time. I, I have to, though, uh, since the, the name of, uh, since you sp ended on the note of inclusion and also had a slide which made reference to the Postmaster General Farley, uh, just one one historical anecdote, if I can be permitted. When my father took his first job in 1934 with the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, uh, he uh, had been in the office for a few days, and he was called upstairs to the representative of the Postmaster General, who had a question, which was, son, are you a member in good standing, a loyal member of the Democratic Party? Uh, was the only thing he was interested, the answer was, of course, yes. The fact that my father was Canadian, was not an American citizen, was not raised and would not have been considered relevant. So it was very inclusive from that point of view. I have to say, just on my own behalf, uh, and I think I speak for everybody here, 
uh, that this has been a most remarkable two days. I feel extremely privileged that all of you were able and willing to come and join us uh, and to participate and to give the contribution. I think we've made a memorable impression on each other and on those who came and also on those who will, who will later see it on, on the web. I have to say a, a word of the deepest thanks uh, to those who contributed all along, to our friends from the Hans Berkler Stiftung, who's been steadfast supporters of these conferences, and especially of this one, uh, to the uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking. So Sebastian and Tom, thank you both very, very much. Here at UT, the Center for European Studies, the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, the LBJ School of Public Affairs, uh, and my chair, the Lloyd M. Benson Chair in Government Business Relations Hall, contributed uh, to this meeting to its success. Uh, but uh, really, the success of the meeting rested on something else entirely, and I, I need to make reference to it, so don't walk out, Celia, uh, because you're, yeah, there we are, okay. Uh, but the, uh, the people who made this work, there's, there's, there, there's Celia Lovett, Kelly Prattlett. I want to thank the, the media crew who's here, uh, the camera people and the electronics people, and, and, and indispensable. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and above all, the person who captained the ship was Lovedy Grossman. Uh, Lovedy uh, had to deal with an indefinite number of, of, of minor and major complications as we moved along and held this thing together and made it all come out. Uh, to be the success, I think, that it has been in the end. So uh, uh, she's not, I think, right here right now, but we should just give her, uh, for the record, a heartfelt round of applause, along with, with Celia and Kelly. And, uh,